For community to take part in this program is turning everything that we know about how we build cities upside down. For a lot of people, instead of living, they're surviving. You know, there is a movement of people who want to connect to their community, yeah. fight for better working and living conditions. I think the hope for our team in terms of lasting impact is legacies, but also the evolving narrative of what it means to be Jewish. After these three games that happened, and they're just walking on the street, they can point to and say, oh, I know what that tree is. Transness is not a new construct. It's about time that people start recognizing and respecting that. We've worked with Black Creek Farm to re-indigenize their maple harvest. It's about allowing the grassroots and the seeds of imagination to really grow. Ben Swanson and I use she, her pronouns. I am the executive director at the Archive, Canada's LGBTQ2 plus archive. I'd like to welcome you all here tonight. Um, thank you so much for joining us along with my ZM um, and my child in the background to be able to celebrate um, these amazing participants who have made such an impact on um, Toronto. Um, I'd like to start today by uh, doing a land acknowledgement. Um, the archives, uh, where we, um, and well, where we're situated, is uh, located on the lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Huron Wendat. Of course, Toronto is still home to many Indigenous people from across North America and around the world, and we're grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. The Archives strives to gather the story of unheard and silenced voices of the 2SLGBTQ plus first people of the land. And we acknowledge that some stories have already been lost. And we aim to ensure that those that remain and those that are to come are preserved for the future. We encourage you to reflect and look at the calls to action as, as um, Everybody should be doing call to action number 70 is specific to archives and um, our organization is proud to be a part of the response and the completion of that call to action. So um, thank you all for joining us. Thank you to my museum for their support in this project and over the years, all the various projects that have happened. And we hope that you are able to enjoy this wonderful panel of people that um, have made just a huge impact on the lives of so many of us. So thank you very much. Hello and welcome to Activisions, a round table on trans histories and activism in Toronto, which is part of Myzeum's Intersections Festival. This is our eighth annual festival connecting Torontonians with creativity, community, and culture. My name is Nadine Villasine Feldman. I'm the Director of Programming at Myzeum of Toronto. If you're new to Myzeum, we are a city museum that offers experiences that tell the histories of Toronto. And we are so pleased to be presenting the Intersections Festival uh, and its community-led and created programs such as this one. The archives, along with curator Tobarin Waxman, have created Activisions, uh, an exhibition that explores a selection of trans community histories and resilience in Toronto from the 1960s to the 1990s. So we'd like to say a huge thank you to Tobarin and to Reagan and the archives. Um, and of course, we'd like to thank our festival funders, Canadian Heritage. Um, my museum also would uh, not be made possible without the generous support of Diane Blake and Stephen Smith. And so we are so grateful to them both. Um, just uh, an event reminder that this program is an hour and a half long and that a full recording of this event will be available immediately on my Zium's YouTube channel. Um, so I'd like to pass things over to Sly Sarkizova, who will be moderating tonight's conversation. Sly is a psychotherapist, consultant, and clinical supervisor specializing in trauma-informed therapy, mental health, and addiction recovery. Um, so over to you, Sly, to open tonight's roundtable. Thanks so much, Nadine, and thanks uh, to the archives and Myzeum and uh, to, to 
to, to Baran uh, Waxman for this wonderful curated exhibit. It's such a poignant time to have such a panel and such a round table given the turning point that we're all at. And I'm so thrilled and honored to be here and to be able to speak to these uh, legendary trans activists. Um, and it's personally very moving to me as well. So welcome everyone at home. And I hope we have a very enriching conversation today. Um, so I'm just going to uh, link us to one of our indigenous two-spirit ancestors, uh, Ayanna Miracle, uh, just to acknowledge uh, her presence and to quote her from uh, some publishing that she uh, did in the early 2000s, in 2000 in fact, and she had this published as scholarly uh, published uh, material. It was her writing, uh, her analysis, her theorizing from her indigenous two-spirit perspective. Um, and it was entitled A Journey in Gender. And she laid out some of the groundwork uh, for thinking about uh, moving away from binary understandings and, um, and decolonizing. So a quote from her paper, and just to uh, uh, share with you, I am pleased to have the opportunity to present a perception of gender that has existed and continues to exist quite apart from the prevailing Euro-North American norm epitomized by an inflexible Christian pseudoscientific declaration of one's being as either male or female. This immutable declaration of Western society is based on no evidence or criterion other than a single answer to the question, what are its genitalia? So, you know, this sort of signifies a turning point between the 50s to the 90s and just up to the 2000s, um, where right around the 90s and 2000s, we moved into more visibility for trans people and trans healthcare. And it's quite a pivotal historic point where uh, these folks who have done so much amazing activism, which we will be speaking with shortly, um, have so many experiences of, of mobilizing knowledge and resources and their own uh, courageous survival and network sur survival without systems that would acknowledge their reality. So there was a, a whole paradigm of thinking that erased transness, erased personhood outside of the binary norms. And uh, Ayanna's writing speaks to that and so does her art. So I wanna welcome um, and introduce just briefly, uh, Mira Soleil Ross. We are so thrilled to have you and I'm so honored to be speaking with you. Mira, um, Mira Soleil is a transsexual videographer, a performance artist, a sex worker and activist. Since the early 90s, her work has focused on transsexual rights, access to resources, advocacy for sex workers and animal rights in Montreal and Toronto. As well, we have Rupert Raj. Um, Rupert is a prolific activist as well. He has been doing activism for 50 plus years. Um, Rupert is a transgender activist, trans social author, and former psychotherapist. Raj, Rupert Raj is a transgender pioneer who dedicated his career to clinical research, counseling, and advocacy for the transgender community. Rupert established and co-established some of Canada's earliest trans advocacy organizations, including the Foundation for the Advancement of Canadian Transsexuals. Um, as well, Rupert has established the first national transsexual newsletter in Canada, Gender Review, a factual journal. We'll get to more information about Rupert shortly. And I'm so thrilled to be chatting with Rupert here today as well and to have him join us. And finally, we do, we do have Monica Forrester. So Monica is a two-spirit trans woman, a community activist, a sex worker, and an important piece of Toronto's LGBTQ history. Monica has an ongoing and intensive life of advocacy work in Toronto. She is the executive director and founder of Trans Pride Toronto. She formerly worked at the 519 where she contributed to trans programming and was the outreach worker for the Trans Sex Worker Outreach Program. She is currently um, the program coordinator for the Aboriginal Sex Worker Education and Outreach Project at Maggie's, the Toronto Sex Worker Action Project. Um, so, hi, welcome everyone. Do we have Mira? Whee! <laughs> Hello, Monica. My thoughts. See, can you hear me, Monica? Yes, honey, I can hear you. Rupert, hey. Rupert. Can turn you your camera me? on, Mira. Hello. Yes. Can you, yes. Can you turn your camera on? on. Can you grace us with your visual presence? Oh shit! Fuck. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful. 
wonderful. <laughs> So this is our theme. Our theme is compliance, defiance, self, and other reliance. And I, I just gleaned that from running <coughs> your, your, you know, your histories that you've contributed this wonderful, um, you know, space to be ourselves. And Nira, just maybe we can start with you. Um, uh, one of your quotes that I came across, yes, help yourself. Make sure you're well taken care of. If anyone needs to go to the bathroom. I thought you were going to start with Rupert, so I started a cigarette. Or if anyone needs to take a snack or have some, okay, you know. I'm fine. Bake a cake. I don't know. Anyway, so <laughs> welcome, everyone. Clean uh, the litter. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Housekeeping. Uh, Mira, let's start with you. So, you know, um, one of the last quotes that we have uh, from an interview several years ago, actually, uh, it's such a pointing quote. You had said, I'm hoping one day the queer movement uh, is able to open its political agenda to recognize and embrace struggles that go beyond its immediate boundaries. I'm not too optimistic this will happen, but I would love for you to prove me wrong. Um, so I know that you know you have, um, you have been involved with the Animal Liberation Front. You have been um, a vocal, fearless advocate and activist for uh, trans women and sex worker rights and um, just humanization, um, particularly in the 90s, um, and especially for folks that are had marginal incomes at the time. Um, and you, you're a prolific artist, performance artist, activist, uh, videographer. Um, you have quite an archive. And I just, you have zines that <coughs> are epic. Gender Trash from Hell is another uh, quarterly zine that you have produced with your partner at the time, Xanthra Philippa McKay. And you um, you established the very first transsexual, tra transgender and intersex art festival called Counting Past Two, um, on and on and on. And even, um, I really like the title of your one woman show, Yapping Out Loud Contagious Thoughts from an Unrepentant Whore. I wonder, um, in general, you were doing a lot of activism for sex worker rights and trans women um, when you think about this idea of compliance, defiance, um, self or other reliance, and your original quote, I'm hoping one day the queer movement is able to open its political agenda to recognize and embrace struggles that go beyond its immediate boundaries. I'm not too optimistic this will happen, but I'd love you to prove me wrong. Do you think of that quote and where, where do you think we are now? I think we're in a good place. I'm not, I don't want to be optimistic and sound like a politician, but I think we're in a good place. There are so many like movements going on. Black Lives Matter, Indigenous People Struggles, uh, LGBTQ plus and Two Spirit Struggles and everything. I think there's a lot of discussions going on, whether it's in the mainstream or whether it's inside the community the marginalized communities that are trying because it's such we're such diverse communities and individuals and we come from different places so people like are really working through the 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 the, the hard muddy work that needs to be done but i think it's happening i I can be very pessimistic and say, I never want to come back on this earth. It's awful. The animals eat each other. Humans eat animals, animals, and this, all the insects get eaten alive. The zebra who's pregnant gets slit open by the hyenas who eat the baby and everything. So I can be very pet pessimistic, but I choose not to because I watch the media and everything, and there's a lot of conversations going on and a lot of... Um, uh, social movements that are emerging, not emerging, they, they were always there, but that continue the hard work <coughs> of carrying on uh, activism uh, um, to try to better the circumstances of marginalized communities. That's wonderful. And do you feel like, uh, Mira Soleil, that, you, you know, part of the work that you were doing, do you feel like some of that has been accomplished so far? Yes. I mean, I live in Quebec. I come from a very, very, I'm talking about animals right now, but uh, <clears throat> I come from a very, very meat-centered, hunting-based, fishing-based 
I wouldn't say animal abuse. People were just doing what they needed to do to to survive. But I come from a deeply like meaty meat centered culture, and I go to the convenience uh, the convenience store now. There's soya milk there. Something has happened <laughs> since uh, you know I got involved in the animal rights movement around 1986. So something has happened. We have the choice now to to drink soya milk if we want instead of cow milk. My um, my companion with whom I, I live is not, uh, <coughs> uh, he's, he's a meat eater, but very, very little because I cook mainly, but uh, he uh, drinks milk, cow milk. There's organic, there's organic cow milk, <laughs> you know, at the convenience store. So mm -hmm. I feel there's like, you couldn't find a can of chickpea at a convenience store when I was 16 years old, especially where I live and I come from. So I think a lot has happened and a lot has changed and the conversations are going. Sometimes they're difficult, but uh, I look at them from uh, a bit on the periphery. I don't want to get involved anymore. <laughs> may I ask why you may not want to be involved? I, you don't have to answer. I, I don't have, no, no, no. It's a simple answer. I don't have the physical health. Mm -hmm mental health, yeah. spiritual health, mm -hmm. in order to be able to do the kind of work I was doing in Toronto. Okay. <clears throat> it requires a lot of strength and a lot of like, a lot of ego too. My ego has gone to zero, you know, <laughs> over the last um, 15 years, let's say. So you need an, e an ego in order to be able to be an artist or to be able to do like activism work where you go in front of people and you tell them, you should do that. You should do that. You shouldn't do that. You shouldn't do that. Et cetera. Okay. Wonderful. Well, and you've contributed so much. So you know what? It, it sounds like you're happy. It's done. I've done my part. Yeah. So I identify as asexual now. <laughs> and people ask me, yeah. how can you, you know, you know what? I fucking had so much sex in my life. I don't need that anymore. <laughs> I'm over that. Like I prefer to play my accordion. <laughs> <laughs> You don't have the oh, right to change. <laughs> and I think I have deserved the right to be asexual. And you can to, be whatever uh, you want. Without Absolutely. being anti-sex, I'm pro-sex. And yes. I, I, I support friends who are struggling through sexuality and gender and everything. But it's like I deserve the right to not want to have sex anymore. <laughs> It's 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 your free choice and you've earned it more than earned it. Um, okay, great. So thank you for um, just chatting for a moment and getting us oriented to you and who you are. Um, I'm just going to switch to Rupert for a moment and spend a little time with him. Um, so Rupert, you are, are, are a Eurasian Canadian pansexual trans elder activist. You were a psychotherapist. Uh, you and I worked together previously at uh, Sherburne Health Center and You've been working, you've been doing trans-related healthcare activism, you've been doing um, peer support activism, just networking for 50 plus years. Um, you're also one of the first trans men in Canada to tr transition and as well internationally. Um, you advocated for your, your own access to hormone therapy when it was not available at all and you, um, you had to go through your own activism as a young person to do that. Uh, and we can get into that in a moment. You have dedicated your your career to research and writing and disseminating new newsletters and actually just building community connections across the states in San Francisco, um, over to the UK, all across Canada, um, you know, in Ottawa, Montreal, Calgary, Vancouver. Um, you established and co-established one of the earliest trans advocacy or organiza organizations, FACT, the Foundation for the Advancement of Canadian Transsexuals. Um, your uh, newsletter, Gender Review, a factual journal, uh, was the first trans newsletter in Canada, disseminating information that was not widely available anywhere. We didn't have the internet, right? So newsletters and uh, networking and calling people up and dialing on the phone and perhaps going on trips on the bus to, to you know, over to New York or whatever uh, were the ways in which, you know, you operated. So, um Rupert, you also have three books, Trans Activism in Canada, A Reader, a scholarly uh, archive of trans activism, uh, focusing on Canada, which we rarely see. You have an unpublished uh, book of poetry uh, called Of Souls and Roles of Sex and Gender, a, trans a Treasury of Transsexual, Transgenderist, and Transvestic Vestic Verse from 1967 to 1991. 
And, oh, actually, we do have that here. Yes, this is where we're here. <laughs> this is what we're doing. Actually, your, your materials are here. This is why we're having this round table. So we do have that here, a copy of that, and uh, folks can come and check it out. Um, and you also have uh, your own memoir published, Dancing the Dialectic. Thank you for those uh, visuals. Uh, True Tales of a Transgender Trailblazer. We have so few of our own early trans activists documented. And, you know, you're all of a generation where, well, you know, most of you actually, but, um, you know, uh, where, where, where you weren't allowed to exist. And it took so much of your time and energy and welfare just to create space for yourself in a world that, uh, that wanted to not have you around and where people may not have known exactly what to do with you, um, including in the medical system, especially. Um, Rupert, when you think about where we're at today, just to orient ourselves, and in light of some of the work that you've done over your activist career, do you feel hopeful today? Where, where are you at right now? Yes, good question, Sly. So um, there's, uh, you know, how social movements go, two steps forward, or one step forward, two steps backward, backwards. And of course, there's uh, all of that anti trans backlash in the US, especially in the UK and also a little bit in Canada, which is very disheartening given all the wins that we did from the 70s right up to uh, right up to the present. Uh, however, we do have a lot of um, uh, good stuff happening like Black Lives Matter, uh, and lots of uh, solidarity in the community, although we need more between uh, trans and sexual cross-dressers non-binary, two-spirit, intersex folks, and our cisgender allies. That's the one good thing, I think. The cisgender uh, allies, straight, uh, queer and straight, and bi and asexual, are much more uh, supportive now than, than quite a while back. And we have the internet, so that helps. Thank you, Rupert. Great. We'll uh, switch over to Monica and then we'll get into like a group discussion and see if we can generate some great conversation between you folks. So Monica, welcome. It's such an honor to re-meet you. I believe we were in passing at the 519 a few times. Um, it's nice to see you. Um, you've been referred to as a living archive. I'm not sure if you appreciate that or not. It sounds amazing. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, so um, you are a two-spirit trans woman, a community activist, a sex worker from the 1990s until now, uh, or the 2010s. Um, you're the executive director and founder of Trans, trans Pride Toronto. You did work at the 519 with trans programming outreach uh, for the trans sex worker outreach program. You're now the program coordinator for Aboriginal sex workers education and outreach project at Maggie's. Um, you've done so much advocacy advocacy and inclusion for trans women and trans women in the shelter system as well. You've produced various zines and poems and journals, which we have on hand here mm -hmm. uh, for folks to check out. How are, how, you know, you, act, you did activism for safer sex worker conditions, um, especially uh, around 2013 when the Sur Supreme Court was uh, considering, um, you know, what they should do around the uh, unconstitutional of anti-sex worker laws. How are you doing today, like in 2023? Um, <laughs> Where well, are you at? I like to say thanks to like Mira and <laughs> Mira that like, gave me the job was one of the, the instrumental people that gave me a voice to actually work at the 519. And many of my past sisters that passed away that were really advocates in our community when there were struggles and were times when trans people would go into spaces and people wouldn't acknowledge us or try to convert us or are those sex workers or you know what I mean and even even in the larger LGBTQ2 plus saying questioning community we lived in the shadows people looked at us like these people that didn't exist right so um Wow, yeah, so, and also Maggie's. Maggie's was very instrumental as a sex worker for over 30 years. It was the only place where people like Mira Soleil and people that, uh, 
you know, sex workers can get together and just talk about how to mobilize and how to stay strong and how to support each other. And, um, you know, because at that time, you know, um, policing was really hard for a lot of sex workers. Um, but, you know, give, given that chance to actually do the work uh, with Mir at the 519 gave me a voice. You know, uh, when Mir moved on, unfortunately, left me there. <laughs> um, you know, that's when my voice came a little stronger and uh, and I was, you know, I was kind of confronted with resistance, right? I'm just a trans woman of color. You know, you don't have a voice on what happens to our programs. And that's how I found the Trans Pride Toronto because I was like, no one's gonna tell me what my community needs and what, you know what I mean? And how they're gonna dictate our lives, right? So that's been really the, the focal point in a lot of my work is to make sure that our voices are being amplified in every area of our in our city, if it's uh, through housing, homelessness, sex work, uh, you know what I mean, through policing. You know, um, when we think around Laura Wells and, you know, uh, she was in a morgue and the cops had her and, you know what I mean? And some agencies knew about this, which was really alarming to me. And these are agencies that are supporting trans sex workers, right? So uh, that really upset me, you know what yeah. I mean? It really upset me to think that, you know, what has it come to? We got all these, you know, great agencies doing a lot of work for trans people of color, trans people in general. But when, you know, when it comes to, to the, to, to, uh, fighting or, or supporting the lives of trans uh, people. It's, it's a, you know, so, you know, so my main mission is getting out there and I've worked in over since I've been doing community services for 25 years is to actually bring a face into many different agencies. So I've worked in over 10 agencies in the last 20 odd years. And that's to bring not only visibility, but inclusion and, and to break some of those stereotypes of trans people. You know, where we are today, yes, there's a lot going on. The movement in Toronto has been really great around visibility, but we also have, like Rupert said, the states where, you know, laws are being overturned and trans people are being, you know what I mean? vilified and criminalized, like, you know, and that's really scary because we're just over the border, you know. Um, so we need to, you know, mobilize our youth. You know, that's something that I, you know, I run like three programs now and I'm really, really happy that I have a lot of agencies that I'm doing a lot of partnerships with to bring more visibility and to empower community. I think it's important that we need to be keeping empowering community to have a voice. You know, I was like, I'm sorry, oh, there's Monica again, you know, and yes, you know, <laughs> there's Monica, you know, up there shooting off her mouth. But no, we need to keep doing those things. You know what I and mean? Uh, we need to keep our voices loud and heard, you know, and even if, it, if you're the elephant in the room or someone's feeling uncomfortable with what you're saying, you know, it's really important that we're amplifying what we need as a community, as people, you know. Um, yeah, so... Um, Thank you, Monica. Yeah, so... The, do, the work, you, yeah, go you, ahead. You actually have um, your collection here, and there are a number of archives here at 34 at, uh, Isabella for over the last 50 yeah. years of uh, trans sex worker rights activism and even letters to folks in prison. I think, Mira mm -hmm. Soleil, we have some of your... I think postcards um, in the exhibit here uh, of uh, the uh, some of your zines were referenced around like you know sex worker activism, but also like prison prison abolitionism and like encouraging people to be in contact with folks. Oh, your mic. Yeah. Oh, yep. Oh no, no thanks. Oh hello. Oh, there we oh, go. There you go. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, I, I want to, to uh, acknowledge something, is that our work at Gender Trash and when we were activists in the uh, 90s, uh, it was done in collaboration with, uh, uh, as, as, it was not a zine, it was like a newspaper called Prison News Services. Mm -hmm. And Prison News Services dis distributed their, their newspaper anywhere any prisoner wanted it. And so we were in contact when we were doing gender trash with uh, prisoner, uh, prisoners in prison. We were in contact with people on death row. We were in con all kinds of people. There were men sometimes who wrote to us who were interested in transsexuals. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> and then there were times where it was most of the time it was like transsexual in prisons yeah so our our influence big influence for supporting um trans women in our case it was trans women specifically in prison uh was to distribute the zine uh freely and to collaborate very intimately with prison news services i forgot the name of the man unfortunately who used to run that newspaper but it would be important to remember him i forgot his name oh they muted my mic and then they unmuted it and they muted it again <laughs> I refer, did you want to add I just wanted to say something about transsexuals in prison, uh, since we're on that subject, is, uh, as you know, I, um, I advertise the, the transsexuals in prison newsletter, the American newsletter, in my metamorphosis newsletter in uh, 1982 to 88, because a prisoner there, Michael J. Ashford, had asked me if I would do that to help promote their, uh, their communication um, newsletter and I also gave a free subscription to the tip subscribers who are, who are American to my metamorphosis. And I also visited Catherine Ann Johnson in Bath, Ontario in 1980, the mid 80s. Uh, she uh, wrote the book Prisoner of Gender with Stephanie Castle in 1998, I believe, which, is, which I gave, which I donated to the archives, I believe. And so I, uh, you know, visited her. She was in an all-male prison because there was very few people helping prisoners transsexual prisoners, including including the adult gender clinic at the Clark Institute of Psychiatry. They had a contract with Corrections Canada and Corrections Ontario, and they would only help these people get on hormones or approve them for surgery once they had been per, uh, uh, on probation or parole, not while they were in prison. And of course, there was that Sylvia Kavanaugh case. So they were really useless to those people. And if it wasn't for me and Mira and Monica and other people, very few handful helping people in Canada or in the U.S. Most most prisoners and most of the prisoners, as you know, are Indigenous or Black, trans women sex workers. Mm -hmm. That's the racial profile, and even in Canada. Mm -hmm. And there are multiple. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say. So I want to, to make it clear that Rupert's work and activism, including like prison support uh, prisoner support activism is a source we have a history in canada right of like intersectional work they call it intersectional work today it's like we were doing that 30 40 years ago god damn it you know and it's like you're just waking up today sometimes i get frustrated it's like intersectional it's like what the fuck we've been talking about that for 40 years including in the trans community so i want to thank rupert for supporting prisoners at this time <laughs> can i ask you were, were you how often were you all in contact or some of you i suppose probably not all of you were in contact well, maybe where is the one that asked me to start the trans men fdm peer support group at the 519 church street community center which is now just called the 519 in Toronto. Right. In 1990, sorry, in 19, uh, 1998, I think it was. Nine, 1999. Nine. 1999, I think it was. So I said, just wait till I get settled into my master's in counseling program uh, at the Adler School of Professional Psychology for a few months. And then I did. And so then I carried that with James Natal, my trans man uh, coordinator, uh, who he said I could use his name. And I mentioned it in my memoir, and uh, we uh, we ran the group for a year. I burned out in the six, first six months, but I had to carry on, uh, even though James Natal left after the first six months as a facilitator, and only stayed on as a member, group member. And finally, I asked Kyle Scanlon to take it over. And on the very last day, when I asked Dr. Hugh McLean to come in to do the consultation for top surgery, and I had the t-shirts for the the members, I couldn't, I was so burnt out, I couldn't even go out to talk to the people. I mm -hmm. said, Kyle, you've got to do it. And then Kyle only lasted a year, and then James Brown took over, and then he left, and then I think uh, Levy, someone else took over, and then Levy came on. So the burnout, which I know we'll talk about later, is yeah. huge, and I've burned out many times. And, and, and part, part of sure the burnout. Too. And Monica. <laughs> yeah, and part of the emotional toll and the exhaustion, uh, I guess at the time, was just having to do so much work put so many hours in to your own survival and making an income, making a learning, 
uh, a living and, uh, you know, being marginally employed because of, you know, trying to be yourself in the world. Um, so what resources, if any, were there for any of you that you connected with or that inspired you to either network more or build, build some resources that didn't, that were needed perhaps that weren't there? Like what was the landscape like for you when you started off sort of, um, just doing your own activism. I, I'm assuming you did it because of the need, right? Because the services weren't there, the access to healthcare wasn't there, uh, the safety wasn't there for sex work or whatnot, um, and, and you needed to create that. But were there existing networks? Were there folks that were role models of compliant, like uh, non-compliance or defiance, you know, in, in being criminalized? Like, what was that like on the ground back back in the '70s, '80s, '90s, whenever it was applicable for you? I'm assuming you probably have more activity at certain certain times. If but you want, I could go first. Uh, sure. I, I uh, lived in Ottawa in 72, but I, I went to Toronto and I met three trans women who started the first trans group in Canada, the Association of Canadian Transsexuals, ACT Act, Diana Lamont from New Brunswick, Lynn Pellerin, French Canadian Acadian from uh, New Brunswick, and um, and Louise, and they, they all started it in 1970 in Toronto. And so I used to go down all those years, many years till I moved to Toronto in 79. And I helped act as a member uh, until 75 when it folded, when Diana Lamont moved to Vancouver and I moved to Vancouver separately. So uh, those three, those three inspired me as well as two American trans activists, Joe, Jude Patton, who's 12 years older than me, and Joanna Clark, who were at Santa Ana, California at that time. They started a newsletter in 1976 called Gender Renaissance, or something to that effect. And that inspired me to start Gender Review in 1978. And, and how did, Rupert, you get connected to Mira? Uh, yeah, I... Well, you don't have to. You don't have to share. I met I met Marin Zanter at the five nineteen. Oh, okay. After okay. after after Marin Zanter started Meal Trends, mm. and then, and and Trish Salah and I uh, put on a, a workshop uh, on body image and self esteem, and we had forty five people. It was like a theater, theater uh, street theater thing. It was really neat. We put it on at the five nineteen and ninety eight. Trish Salah, who's a professor now at University. Uh, um, uh, Queen's University in Kingston. Can I have a bit of context? Zen Zentra. Can you hear me? Hear me? The mic is a little uh, staticky. Or... Oh, sorry, sorry. Can you hear me? Hear me? Mm. Hello, hello? It's it's like an artistic performance. Uh, you have to... <laughs> <laughs> hello, hello? I don't do that anymore. <laughs> hello, yes. hello? Can okay. you hear me? There's a bit of an echo and it's um, multiple channels of sound. Um, There's an option on your audio to, to click on uh, uh, take out the echo. I forget what it's called. Oh. If you go into settings. I wouldn't know that, but it was okay earlier, no? It was. Yeah, I don't know if it's the cord or whatnot. Yeah, I can talk later. <gasps> um, and you can write it on the chat. Who are who you? Are your, oh. Oh, wow. Yeah, you'll have technical assistance shortly, I'm sure, uh, if someone could help these folks out. Um, Mira's mic is not working uh, for the tech side. Uh, Sarah or hello, Gavin, hello. If you could, um, oh, try unplugging your mic. Hello. Yeah. Oh, there you go. I can go now. All right. Yeah. Yay. Okay, so I'm just gonna say Rupert was talking. He gave his he gave his version of how we met. I'll give mine, which is it's in harmony. <laughs> <laughs> Zentra and I were doing gender trash and we're doing a lot of activism and everything. And we had heard of a trans man who was very active in Toronto. And we and we saw his name. His name was Rupert Raj. And Rupert was like in a time of reclusion at the time, if I can say that, Rupert. Mm -hmm. And he was not that active in the community and he kept a distance like we all need to do it many times in our lives. So Zentra and I were like always digging into trans history. So Zentra went to the archives and she photocopied, like I think it was 25 cents a copy. I don't know. She photocopied every single issue of what was it called, Rupert? Gender Review. 
gender Meta review. Meta so we, had like, we had reading, like historical reading. And, it, and then Centra said, we got to find him. And I don't know how we did, but we ended up connecting with you and it was wonderful. Yeah, and we because have my phone, my phone here. was unlisted for oh, several shit. years. And then I just relisted it when you called. I, she, I think she, I was going to say she found you in the phone book, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Rupert, you had an active trail of clues that you had left behind. Yeah! <laughs> <We> tracked him! <laughs> and um, we actually do have uh, those newsletters here at the archives that folks can check out in this. Metamorphosis, uh, gender exhibit. review, gender network. Yeah, a few of the issue, uh, issues and copies. Yeah. They're online in the archives and the digital transgender archive. Sorry, and the. And the Digital Transgender Archive in Boston and the Transgender Archives in Victoria, BC. And I think we have the photocopies that Zentra did somewhere in my collection. I have a question. Did you did did you find that across the gender divide, even though you know we I'm sure during your generation, I'd love for you to speak to this, you know, around gender queerness or androgyny or non-binariness, what was happening at the time. But like there's also this divide you mentioned earlier, Mira, like intersectionality the trans community like did you find that you could like work with each other once you found each other like you know what i mean you're still in contact but like outside of your relationship even how was it to network with each other um you know monica you i know you've had some experiences of connecting with other folks but did you find that it was easy to connect with folks or like how did you know Obviously, you had to find the trail of crumbs that you left behind with the published materials that you disseminated. Um, you had to have a living network, so to speak. So how did you feel? Did you feel linked in with each other? Or what was that like from either of your perspectives? Yeah, so a lot of like, because I came out when I was like 17, 18. So that was like late 80s. As to, like I said, there was no reason, I I don't know, I was a street person, I was a sex worker. A lot of the girls back then, we lived on the streets. We lived in underground garages. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the activism came from the community through storytelling. You know what I mean? Um, the, the events that happened in their life when it came to around policing, how to stand up to police, how to stand up to pimps when they wanted to pimp the girls on the corner. So this is where I got a lot of my, uh, you know, where I learned a lot about the history in the community that I came from. And then Mayor Slay came around in the 90s. She'd be flying around the corners. And that's when we got to see her on Gender Trash, right? And that was probably the first publication that I seen with her and Lanthra. You know what I mean? This Gender Trash, it really was great because it highlighted people in the community about who they were, but also had a very political view on things that what was going on and what they were doing you know and then i met rupert rupert um you know around the time when i started working at the 519 where we kind of worked together i think on some stuff around gender journeys and some other things like that so i think we kind of you know we kind of met each other just through crossways through the work that we were doing or people that we were meeting you know what i mean me me or soleil we put together as Remember that happy transsexual? What was it called? No, no, well, no, 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 it's like a Madame Lorenz transsexual touch. Yeah, so we did a video, a safe sex video <laughs> together with an uh, explicit video. Yeah, with uh, <laughs> we want to share a little context about the video for those of us that are that were around. Monica, okay, so um. <laughs> Mir Soleil, Vivian Namaste from Montreal, um, and some other activists like in Vancouver. Jamie, and, Jamie Lee Hamilton yeah, in yeah. Vancouver. Yeah, Jamie from Vancouver. Uh, we, you know, we got a bunch of money, <laughs> and we want they wanted us to put a safer sex video, not for us because we knew about safe sex. It was for the Johns, so we actually put together this like half hour video around how to how to have sex safely, you know what I mean? But it was really great to, cause we also did a lot of consultations. So it was really great to engage with community, right? Around 
sexual practices and you know what I mean and get to learn about the everyone's lives through that through the west coast to the east coast you know and also we put together member mirror uh, me me you and tina strang we put together the happy, happy transsexual hooker we, yeah so that was the right. first publication for actually sex workers when we came on board at the 519 Wait. was this booklet that was you know was created through the community it had visuals of trans sex workers and how to stay safe and, <laughs> you know what i mean and I remember me, Mira, and Tina were actually, because it kind of blew, like blew off the whatever, and extra, and everyone was down our tails, and we had this big conference, and we're all sitting there, and there's like hundreds of people, we're all nervous, and like, oh my God, I've never did this before, I've never, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, I was so new, right? I was so new around the activism piece, but it was... But it was empowering. It was empowering that we had a piece of, had something that we can say was our own, that we could, we made it and it represented us. And, you know, um, but yeah, I think all of us, you know, we, you know, we kind of interconnected through different projects and, and, and programs that were happening at the time. Yeah. Can I say something real fast? Uh, it's that Monica and Tina came aboard uh, on, um, uh, at, the, at the 519 uh, for a specifically trans sex worker outreach program. And it had two components. We had gotten money at the 519 to do a project for st street transsexuals. But we had money for somebody to like uh, do outreach and somebody to do a booklet, like uh, a tool. Mm -hmm. So we ha we were supposed to hire just one person, but we decided both of them were so wonderful. We hired both Monica and Tina, and we split the job in two. <laughs> oh. And Monica did uh, the happy, not Monica, uh, Tina did the happy transsexual hooker, and Monica started a powerful outreach uh, program for transsex workers. Yeah. So it was, we all were collaboratively, like... We you know, um, I got the <laughs> no woman choice. into the outreach because, like I said, I worked the streets for many years, so I had those strengths. So we all had different strengths and how to make exactly. Yeah, and you had the knowledge and the relationships also yeah. with the girls in the community. At the, at the point where um, Monica came aboard, I was not very much in touch because I was not working on the street anymore. I was just an escort, and I was not in touch with the street girls like Monica was. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so she came aboard and brought a lot of strength on. Go ahead, Rupert. Thank you, Mia. Yeah, and um, my friend Lynn Pellerin was in the, uh, the video that Monica and Mary Vivian did. There's a nice picture of still on V tape, and we have that here on the V tape website where she's out spreading her arms, taking up her rightful place in the universe. It's a wonderful uh, still. I'm not sure if she was credited in the video or not. But she's the one that I mentioned that was one of the three women that started the Association for Canadian Transsexuals. She moved from New Brunswick to Montreal and then Toronto, and she lived in Calgary, Vancouver, all over Ottawa. And the other thing I'd like to say is the personal and the political. Xander McKay was my roommate. After, after Mira moved out, I moved in with Xander for a year and a half. And of course, uh, Mira and Xander and I were friends, and Trish. And, like, like in those days, I guess now too, um, the personal and the political. We did community stuff together, professional stuff sometimes, personal stuff, social stuff. So, uh, and in my memoir, I talk about the in interweaving of the personal and the political. Was there a connection to, I mean, it sounds like you, you just sort of built relationships where you needed to, and you did what you had to do. Uh, you, I don't know if you really called it activism or you just did it. Would you have called yourselves activists, or did you, did you just do stuff like? <laughs> <laughs> it depends if you're talking. A, gen a gender, a gender worker, and back then we used the term professional transsexual. We didn't really mm. use the word activist. Okay, Mira. <laughs> I was gonna say that like, uh, there's the political, there's the personal, but it intertwines. You know, mm -hmm. Zantra and I were lovers. So uh, we were political activists, like, I don't know how to, it's a, ma a political marriage. Mm -hmm. uh, Rupert and Zandra were roommates. So it's like, it's also like a relationship. So we have relationships 
for decades with each other. You know, uh, Monica, do you remember the first time we met or one of the first times it was at Nancy's place with the cockroaches on the wall? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> fuck, Wilhelmina was there, no? Yeah, I remember. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you see, we had relationships often before to become a, a co uh, colleagues in activism. Did you find that um, there was overlap between, you know, pushing for access to trans health care around the time that you knew each other um, and sex worker rights and, you know, decriminalization and stuff like that? Like, how did health care access and the need for greater access play into any of those different realms that you were involved in? Or did it? Well, I know too was once I started working with Mira and many people in the community, one thing that was really alarming was the homelessness of trans, uh, more marginalized trans people. And, um, and a lot of trans women were going to men's shelters. And there was 1% that were actually accessing women's shelters because they were either 100% passing, and I hate using that word, or they had reassignment surgery. So actually the city actually hired me and Tina to do a consultation with all the shelters in the city around accessibility. And it was alarming that none of them were accessible, right? So uh, that's when the city actually pushed to make that they had to be accessible within a year to allow trans identified folks or non-binary folks to be able to go to the shelter they choose to go to. Uh, but it was a lot of work because even though they were forced to do it, doesn't mean the circumstances were any better, right? So they were putting trans people all in one room or uh, they're telling them they had to look a certain way because they're gonna scare other women because of, you know, there was so much. And then that's when, um, Alec came into play with around policy, you know, and around policy around, you know, why are you instructing these, these, uh, you know, these rules on trans people to look a certain way because we've got to make other people comfortable. You know what I mean? It's like, it was really weird. I go into these workshops and it's like, there was how many women were wearing skirts that day? There was one, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, why are you imposing these kind of, these things on trans people that they have to look ultra femme, they have to have makeup on, they have to have, if they don't have breasts, have palsy dims. You know what I mean? And when we think around the diversity of women in our society, we all look different, right? So there was so much work and I'm not saying shelters are the safest place today. We're still seeing a lot of stigma and discrimination around trans folks. And then when we hear these isolated incidents around sexual violence or these little things, that, that pushback comes. So that's one thing I really recognized in a lot of my work is the pushback, right? People are still resisting, you know what I mean? As much as louder, more louder we get, the more resistant we get, right? And uh, that's what scares me the most is that, you know, without keeping those voices amplified is that things could change, Absolutely. you know? Yeah. So, um, um, did folks I have access to hormones and how did they get information about transitioning in the process of transitioning? I mean, uh, for you, you know, as a youth, you know, I had to do street hormones because I was actually, my doctor said, go to the clerk. And there was a criteria back then, you know, you couldn't be a sex worker. You right. had to live, you know, a year or two without hormones. It's like, you know, that's put setting people up. You know, so a lot of my peers, we did hormones underground. We were just buying them off of people, you know what I mean? And then maybe a year later, I'll go to my doctor. He's like, oh, okay, I'll give you hormones. But, you know, these things are still happening. You know what I mean? Um, I'm glad to say at Street Health, where I've been working the last eight years, we're actually implementing a program for trans and non-binary folks for access of care. So they can actually get hormones and they can actually get referrals to doctors and get all these things, right? So it's also around being visible and, and reckon, you know, as we see now, we're seeing more access of trans people in a lot of community service and not just specifically in LGBTQ plus communities, because I work outside of those communities. So we're seeing such a more visibility, right? So um, mm. it's really great that a lot of agencies are taking that lead to making sure there's supports built into their you know what I mean, into their work to make sure that everyone is, uh, you know, recognized and supported. So. Yeah. 
And that's one Thank of the you, reasons Sh I, Sherburn Healthcare Center, Sherburn, and that's one of the reasons Sherburn Health Center uh, was uh, established in 2002, it was 2002, because uh, although we did have a health center at 410 up the street, part of St. Mike's, uh, because a lot of a lot of trans women uh, street active uh, did not have doctors or want to come to doctors, but some of them did go to uh, health center at 410 St. Mike's, and then when Sherburn started, a lot of them felt comfortable because the number of the doctors there were assist. Uh, Cis queer, cisgender, gay, lesbian, or trans. Uh, we had a, we had a, do a trans woman doctor there, Dr. Sydney Town. We had um, uh, other trans people working there: Vlad Walnick, uh, Emery Potter, and, uh, and um, Terry Matthews, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Rachel Ham, Rebecca Hammond, myself, and you work there, Sly, and others. So um, that's that's yeah. why. Um, and the people, the, the business people didn't want didn't want another health center there because they were afraid that it would attract more street people, but they were already there. <laughs> the shelters mm -hmm. were already there. And and Sherburn Health Center I, was was not competing with, with uh, St. Mike's Health Center. May I ask, uh, uh, in connecting these uh, links to, you know, embodiment, like being able to like have access to hormones and like the real life tests and all that sort of stuff, especially Rupert back in your uh, early activist uh, work and stuff like that, like did you find that there was I mean, you were talking about depathologization from the time I think that you were seeking your own hormones. Uh, were people having these conversations? Who was in favor of depathologizing trans care and who wasn't? Yes, I had to, as you know, because you read my memoir, I had to leave my own country and go to the U.S. I had to go to uh, New York in 1971 to get a prescription for hormones because uh, my psychiatrist at the Royal Ottawa Hospital where I was living at the time, uh, he said uh, because I was underage and my parents had died in 1968, uh, and I had you had to be 21, and I was um, I was uh, I was 17. Uh, actually, I was 16 when my parents died, so I had to I had to wait. They they wouldn't uh, my psychiatrist wouldn't give me hormones, and uh, and he also thought it was he also thought it was a phase I was going through because my parents had died and I started wearing my father's jacket and so on and so on. Anyway, I went to New York and lived. my brother was my next li living kin. He signed He signed off for me when I was 19 and a half. Dr. Charles Eilenfeld, I worked with Dr. Gary Benjamin, gave me my, my hormone check. I um, I think one of my transitions is one of the longest in the world, 41 years from 1971 to 2012 for the hormone therapy and the three surgeries I underwent. And I had to go to two countries, Canada and the U.S., and three provinces, Ontario, Alberta, and Quebec, which is ridiculous that Canadians have to, have to and pay for all that myself, have to do that because there was not these things available locally back then, and even now, I mean, it's a little bit better now. But not everything is covered by, by uh, provincial health or territorial health insurance in these provinces. It's like a checkerboard, what's covered and what isn't. And electrolysis often is not covered for trans women. May I ask, um, in terms of how psychiatry was sort of governing trans healthcare access, like, did you, each of you from your respective perspectives, did you feel like you had to engage in resistance just to, <clears throat> just to navigate trans healthcare? Like, how did that work for you? Like, I assume that was a lot of fuel for your fire in your artwork, for example or mobilizing and networking with each other, the narratives that were sort of circulating from psychiatry about trans people um, and just sort of like stigmatizing and stereotyping, you know, transness and trans women, especially, and trans men in their own ways. You know, Mira, maybe you can speak to this a little bit. I'm gonna talk about a debate that's old but uh, in the, the 1990s, we had a debate in the trans community, transsexual specific community, about mental illness and mm -hmm. uh, transsexuality being consider considered a mental illness or not in the DSM. And we fought to remove it. And some, we were a lot of people who are people with disabilities and mental illnesses who were very offended 
by trans activists who were trying to delist from the DSM transsexuality because we felt we should stand in solidarity with people who are in that book. It's not just transsexuals who are in that book. There's all kinds of other people. There's all kinds of silly diagnosis in that book, you know? So it's like, get rid of the whole fucking book. <clears throat> but don't try to distance yourself politically from disabled people and from mentally ill people and from drug addicts and from et cetera, et cetera, all the things that are stigmatized in psychiatry. So in the um, 1990s, we had a, a debate, a conversation. It was rough about that. Today, I think people most agree that like transsexuality, like homosexuality, should be, shouldn't be considered a mental illness. But it's still in the book. It's still in the book in different yeah. ways, you know? And it, we, we can segue to this a bit later, but there is this narrative that is being weaponized against trans people again today, especially coming out of the States. But I was just curious because this is about the, this, you know, the period from the 50s to the 90s, like how how, like what you were all up against, even in the 90s when you were trying to figure out solidarity with each other and like, you know, it's like, do we get access if we say we're not mentally ill and then who, do, who is left behind and who are, you know, who else are we distancing ourselves from in order? And it sounds like you tried to keep everyone together to keep people safe. Not easy, <laughs> not easy. Especially when the systemic power was so entrenched. And today, to this day, I, I, I had my genital surgery. It's a revelation tonight. I had my genital surgery two months ago, Patrice. Wait, two months ago. Congratulations. Thank you very much. I had to have a letter from my psychiatrist who said I was sane. I had to get a letter from a, a sexologist, my endocrinologist, my family doctor, and I had to lie sometimes on the papers a little bit. <clears throat> like, um, you're not supposed to smoke. Mm -hmm. I lied a bit on the paper and everything. So all of this is like a theater. You just need to play the game and everything. But it's just like... Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was... I was uh, the, uh, they gave me the surgery because... And they paid for it. Because I was in the psychiatric system. So things have not changed that much. Right. So you have to still, you, I guess in Quebec, you, you had to Wait, go through the, Quebec. Wait. yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait. It's a huge process. Right. Somebody who's on the street and who's a drug mm -hmm. addict and is, is struggling to survive and have housing, he's not going to be able to go through that process. Well, that's that interesting connection again, I think, between surviving on the streets and, and, you know, survival work or survival sex work and like getting access, you know, even in the 90s, 80s, whatever, it's like that would have been, you know, it's 2023 and we have way more access than we ever did. Uh, but like in the 90s and 80s and before that, like, you know, what kind of access would people even have? And, and did you know that, and did you know that the sex reassignment surgeons, that's called uh, confer, um, Confirming gender, gender surgery. Confirming. Gender confirming surgery. <laughs> All these acronyms. We're getting lost, uh, me and Rupert and Monica with the with the terminology. <laughs> Professor Robert Curry wrote a wrote a thesis called uh, a thesis, which is online, uh, 1975, comparing uh, comparing the right uh, advocating for the right for trans people uh, to uh, undergo sexual assignment surgery if they chose, comparing that to cisgender people who wanted to be voluntarily sterilized. And the reason he wrote that, and he compared Quebec law, English common, Canadian English common law, American law, and French law, and uh, and I think other law. And the other, the other reason, uh, what happened was, uh, Dr. Roberto Farina in Brazil was put in jail for two years in the 80s and, uh, for doing sex reassignment surgery. And his book is in Portuguese on transsexualism and intersex. It's, it's, and I donated one of my books to the archives. Here. It's a brilliant, brilliant book. So the, even the even the even the people trying to help us often were in very gray, murky waters in terms of the law in the seventies yeah. and eighties. So and that's a very a very telling point. 
and how how was the rest of the community from any of your perspectives maybe monica you can chime in here like uh, what about the lgb community being in connection with or in allegiance or in alliance or you know um with your you know access to healthcare you know needs and activism like work was the lgb community like actively working against you in terms of like maintaining norms and their rights that they were accruing like what was what was happening there or maybe in the 80s 90s I could say the good thing for a lot of the street base workers, there was actually a doctor that actually was at the end of the street where we worked, <laughs> which would give us hormones. <laughs> you know what I mean? She did it. Her name was Dr. Drummond, and she was considered a wife. <laughs> but she, we'd go in there, she was very empathetic, and she would give us hormones, you know? So it was great for a lot of street base workers that were going through these obstacles to get hormones or, you know, and being kind of refused because they were doing sex work or all these other things. Uh, so, you know, it was about mobilizing community on resources and how to get healthcare, even though it's probably not the best way to acquire this healthcare, you know what I mean? Not the safest, right? But when we think about, you know, our bodies and our choices and what we need to survive, you know what I mean? And that's something that I wouldn't, something I've really acknowledged over the years that what is right or wrong when it comes to, uh, you know, being our authentic selves. You know what I mean? And why and why should we have to go through obstacles to access something that's very life changing for some people? You know what I mean? So um like I said, I went underground and then I met Doctor, you know, Dr. Drummond and there was a few doctors that were just very supportive. Today I've been with uh, Sherman Health with Dr. Tam. She's amazing, you know. Um, but once again, there's also you know that backlog there too, right? They're you know uh, getting to see a doctor in a lot of these places is really like a year waiting list, or you know what I mean. So <clears throat> as the community grows, as youth are coming out, more people are coming out and wanting to transition, the resources are not as available. You know, so we have also like Women's College that's really stepped up and, you know, is doing a lot of trans care and surgeries. And, you know, one thing I can say today is like, wow, you know, <laughs> that, you know, I'm seeing people getting their reassignment surgeries in a year or getting all these documents that they need. So there is a lot of work to really break through those kind of, you know what I mean? Those areas where, you know, people are in like limbo because, you know, they can't get a job or, you know, they don't want to be living as their gender until they feel like they can, you know what I mean? Or, they, or they're being like, you know, refused uh, healthcare because they're not believed, right? So uh, the, like, you know, and I, like I said, through a lot of us, Rupert and everyone else, that's really, kind of put those footprints in to make change mm -hmm. work. The fruitation is happening now where we're seeing a lot of people and access is more accessible than ever. So It's literally because of Rupert and Mira and yourself, Monica, and others that have done all this work to normalize being trans or non-normalize it, but like make it so that like people yes. actually see you as, you know, <laughs> as real. <laughs> You Can know. I add one thing but mm -hmm. just before you Please jump do. to the audience? Yeah, I'd like to get this in. So talking about our cisgender allies, as I was yes. before, uh, Sherry, Sherry DeNovo um, was a, a member of provincial parliament back then, cis queer uh, person, a lovely uh, advocate. So uh, the Trans Health Lobby Group was started in 2001 by myself, Susan Gapka, Michelle Hogan, Joanne Neverman, Darla S. And later we had... Um, Later we had uh, uh, Davina Hader and Martin Stonehouse and someone else, I just forgot, Shad Manzo and others. I was the only trans man group. I was the only trans man in the group. We had one or two float in and out, but I don't know if there's any now, uh, which also was indicative of the early work I did. I was always the only, often the only trans man in North America back in the uh, 70s that worked, that supported trans women. So anyway, the tr right. we, got, we got SRS, sexual assignment surgery, uh, gender confirming surgery 
relisted 10 years after it was delisted in 1998 in Ontario and with the help of George Smitherman too. But, and we uh, have actually, uh, some video footage of Sherry that Sherry was the one. So good uh, good kudos to our CIS allies, Sherry Denova and her trans uh, uh, peer uh, activists. Can I say just one thing fast, uh, Rupert? I don't want to be a sucker, but I want to say that you've always been like a great supporter of trans women as a trans man. I don't know how to express it, but you have friends. You, I don't want to talk about your private life, but you, you, you've, you've been very close to trans women all your life, often when you were a minority like one trans man amongst trans women. And I, I want to recognize that you are comfortable with trans women as a trans man. I love you. Oh my <laughs> gosh. You, as Wonderful. you say, I've had close friends, partners who are trans men or trans women or non-binary friends, roommates, colleagues, the personal and the political. <laughs> yes, I love trans women. That's so lovely. Love you, and, um, and Monica. <laughs> Slide. <laughs> uh, so heartfelt. Um, I wonder if we could take an opportunity to see what the audience thinks. Um, maybe they can shoot us a question and we can see what's on folks' minds. Um, and uh, yeah, we can, we can take it from there. We do have about 10 or 12 minutes left. Um, is there anything any of you um, wanted to say tonight just in relation to yourselves being here or um, trans issues in general, or the course of your activism? Is there anything on your mind like that you never got a chance to say or share for whatever reason? I just want, uh, before we take questions, to say hello to Zantra, mm -hmm. to say hello to Ayana, and to say hello to Mark, my former husband. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, in terms of, we'll just give folks a minute to chime in with their questions. Uh, maybe we can pivot to what do you think the work is today? Out of all the things that you've seen and done and heard of and all everything that we, you all have been through and we're still going through, what would you like to see happen that, you know, maybe you could have benefited from back in the day when you felt like, the mass of society was against you and you had your few tight people that were like forming a strong network. Like what would you like to see as an opportunity in the present day if folks are picking up where you left off? Well, I don't know what I'd like to see, but as someone that's still working in the community and like I said, we have like an abundance of services for trans folks, but I just feel that with all these services, you know, we're still seeing a lot of people in our community that are still homeless, uh, you know, still unemployed, um, you know, still don't have doctors and all these things. And this really is bothersome when I see, uh, you know, um, all this money going into a lot of trans care and trans access, but our most marginalized and racialized communities are still struggling, you know, um, I'm grateful I have a job. I'm grateful I've been at Maggie's for 15 years and have this other part-time job. But I think that just came with my big mouth. <laughs> you know what I mean? I think it came with my advocacy and being out there that people wanted me to be a part of the, their agencies. But I would really like to see, you know, um, really, you know, I've been trying and working to really, you know, figure these things out. Well, not figure these things out, but, you know, start moving people into these places. Like, you know what I mean? Give trans people a chance. Like, you know, trans people and like, you know, they're just as qualified and able and, you know, to do everything that anyone else can do. Since I've been working at Street Health, I was the first trans woman there. And now we have five trans people. You know what I mean? And it's just great to see the diversity, you know, and it, it just takes one of us to make that change and recognize that, you know, that 
trans people are able to do the same kind of work everyone else is too. You know what I mean? So um, there's still a lot of work to be done. You know what I mean? Uh, there's still a lot of, you know, uh, really supporting our most marginalized through COVID, trans pride with no funding mm -hmm. because it's so hard to get funding by, some, you know, some of this relief COVID money because we were a grassroots agency that we were out there every day through COVID giving out food, hygiene supplies, you know what I mean? With dope mm. community money. People believe yeah. in me. And that's one thing that really, to, when I did the was went really loud around Allura Wiles and I was challenging the police and I was doing police searches and I was, you know, and I was rallying at headquarters that, you know, that was a scary moment for me because would people listen to, a, you know, a trans woman of color, sex worker, you know what I mean? Did our lives really matter? You know what I mean? And that was the pivoting moment when I seen hundreds of people come out to do that search. And it wasn't just trans people, it was queer people, it was just, you know, all sorts of people. You know what I mean? So, um, you yeah. know, I think, you know, that's one thing I've been lobbying against with all these federal, uh, like federal provincial funders. It's like, you know, um, that, you know, we need better access to more funding without this red tape. Okay, I'm not the 519. I'm not Sherman Health. But I'll tell you, I'm doing a lot more work than they are in some mm -hmm. areas. You know what I mean? And That's we fair. need to be recognized yeah. for that. And, yeah. you know, I feel like I'm being denied because I'm not one of those corporate or really high-profiled agencies, right? And yeah. I'm so grateful for PWA and street health and places that seem you know, yeah. believed in me, you know yeah. what I mean? That helped me get funding. Maggie's is a trustee of mine. Street Health is doing partnerships. They're writing grants for me. They're getting money for me. You know what I mean? Yeah, and yeah. at the end of the day, I'm like, you know what? That's all I really need. Like <laughs> at the end of the day, I'm just so fed up mm -hmm, trying mm -hmm. to apply for funding. Do you know, I have Transpire Toronto. I'm hiring people in my community so they can work and build skills. Right. You know what yeah. I mean? So money and, directly to the community, not through yeah, and, you bureaucratic know, rigor. A lot of my people that I'm working with don't have skills. Yeah. And I'm giving those those chances. I'm not making money out of Transpire Toronto. Yeah. You know what I mean? But I want to make sure our community can thrive. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And that's something, you know, when I'm lobbying agencies, like, why are you giving trans people precarious hours where they have to work three, mm -hmm. four jobs yeah. and still live in poverty? Yeah. You know what I mean? Don't say this is the quota. Like, oh, we got tons of trans people. But just none of them are full time or they're all entry level jobs. Yeah. You know, these are things that we need to be recognizing that, mm -hmm. you know, we shouldn't be grateful for the spaces that we have or we shouldn't be grateful because we have a job, but we should have the same equity and human rights like everyone else. Seems right? Like so, there's plenty of money to go around. It's there is. Really you know, <laughs> spent in the right places, right? And I don't care what anyone says, trans people go far and beyond to prove our worth, to prove how hard we work and how we make change. So I just had to throw that in there. That <laughs> you know, incredible. because it, just, it yeah. bothers me sometimes yeah. when yeah. I see people, you know, when I see agencies that have a wealth of trans people and they're all working 10 hours a week. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and they're mm -hmm. saying, well, we have tons of trans people. No, yeah. that's not good yeah. enough. Yeah, you I know agree. what I mean. 100%. So, um, I would like to see agencies really pulling up if you really believe support. in equity yeah. and, and with around trans folks, then give them those high paying dollars, give yeah. them those jobs they yeah. deserve, and stuff like that. So Wonderful. That's it for me. <laughs> that's amazing. We'll we'll pivot to the questions in a moment, but I'm curious to hear Mira and Rupert what you want to chime in on at this point, and then we'll go to the comments. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I completely agree with uh, Monica. You know, that's the same thing that happened to me is I was working like always as, as an outreach worker and uh, there's only so much I could do, right? <clears throat> I couldn't, couldn't in the social um, services world accede to something else than just like being asked to be a relationship, a link between the community and them as social services. So I could write the grant and make the link between the two and get them a lot of money and pay us very little. So Monica, I agree with you. Thank you for talking. Thank you, Mira. 
Rupert, how yes, about and you? When I started my work, I was I worked for 23 years uh, minimum wage before I got my job as a career counselor at the AIDS Committee of Toronto in 1999. And I was working then, and I was going to school, doing three certificates, a diploma, and then my two degrees. So I was working full-time, going to school, part-time or full-time, and doing all this activism, unpaid, uh, for the 90% of it unpaid. And in those days, we didn't get honoraria to do workshops and conferences, wow. and we had to pay our own travel and our own hotel. It's only maybe in the, in the very late 90s or the early 20s that started. So that's something the young kids don't have a clue about. They really don't. It's really sad that the young cisgender, queer, and trans folks and two-spirit uh, and uh, intersex non-binary don't know their own history. I asked Nancy Nichol if she would do a documentary, film documentary on trans history in Canada, because she did four on, oh. on gays and lesbians, gay and men and gay lesbians, which were brilliant. But she, uh, unfortunately, was re getting close to retirement and ran out of time. So we did Rupert Remembers uh, yeah, with the right. Xanthra McKay. Was we the have the video here. Folks can check it out. Yeah, 1999-2000 Rupert Remembers. We have a question uh, from Laura Horak. Uh, what kinds of research do you wish people would do on Canadian trans his history? And what aspects of this history do you want people to know more about? Maybe you want research or maybe you want films and <laughs> interviews. What would you like? to help elevate trans history. That is, there's this growing gap between folks who have that knowledge and the newer generations that don't. Anything? Do your homework, do your homework. <laughs> Fair enough. So come to the archives. That's the advertising. Yeah. It's all here. Everyone's donated their belongings. Come, there is. Come home. I should mention. We give our life. You yeah. mentioned that. Uh, there's three. Uh, there's there's three. Major, there's four major archives. Well, there's okay. There's four archives I can mention. Uh -huh. The Quebec Gay Archives, which has some trans stuff, uh, not too much of mine, but both French, both in French and English, and might have some mirror stuff. There's the archives in Toronto, of course, and then there's the transgender archives at the University of Victoria, and there's a lot of stuff, including some of mine. And there's the uh, Digital Trends Archive in Boston. There's also the Pride Library at the University of Western Toronto. Well, there's lots in of London. documentation. Yeah. And the very first trans library was started by my friend Tara Sipniewski uh, last year. It's called the Ottawa Trans Library. And, and, and she does online stuff all about the history in Ottawa, including Gatineau and Hull, Quebec, because there's a lot of back and forth. And I'm writing an article about the, I'm writing an article about the, connections between English Canada and French Canada, uh, mm -hmm. Toronto, uh, uh, Montreal, Ottawa, Hall, and Gatineau. So, so the check the library and check the, uh, yeah. check the websites and the archives. Amazing. So we do have a wealth of, of reserve information about archival information here at the archives. Come to the exhibit, check it out. Uh, we do have one more comment. Um, Thank you for all your work. Just wondering how you folks push through the frustrations with having to fight so hard to be yourselves, uh, such as all the hoops that we have to jump through. It's been a lifetime of that. How are you? How are you on the other side of that? How are you doing? Is there anything that you need or people could do to make it easier for you now, given all the work that you've contributed? In what ways could community show up for you now? The other Challenge end? yourself. Can I say that? Yes. Challenge yourself. It's really nice to see we support as, cis, as uh, cisgendered people, uh, trans people. It's another thing to say, I'm not, I'm not going to judge people and I'm not going to be attracted or not attracted to or become friend or not with mm. a person who has a specific set of genitals. get to thinking hey yeah yeah and it, that that actually raises a good point it's it's trans folks have done all the labor to change the thinking on gender and bodies and whatnot but we actually need cisgender people to actually think and unthink about their genders and what they we need queer people to question themselves on their own sexualities lesbians don't want to sleep with a trans woman with a vagina what's the problem if the trans woman is a penis What's the problem? 
Don't come and tell me your pronouns are this and that. I want to know how in your personal life mm -hmm. you integrate or exclude trans people. And that often starts with sexuality. And um, oh. I'd like yeah. to mention uh, again, burnout and vicarious traumatization, whether we're a peer counselor, uh, uh, a, a sex worker, a rich worker, uh, a therapist, whatever, an activist, and lots of us have gone through burnout and vicarious traumatization and our own traumatization. And that's where professional and personal supports are critical and also self-care strategies and, and using those self-care strategies, mindfulness practice, whatever. Uh, for me, for me, it's comics, it's uh, blues and jazz and, and rock and folk and it's uh, and the books I like and the shows I like to watch and people I email or connect with in person, like you can come up with whatever works for you, but the self-care strategies are critical. And also um, not trying not to isolate ourselves. I know I, I know I went out for nine years from 1990 to 1999 out of the queer community, out of the trans community, because I was so burnt out. And then I came back and now I'm only active somewhat peripher peripherally. So uh, taking care of ourselves and, and our, our fellow trans folks in society. Thank you, Robert. How about you, Monica? Um, well, you know, being visible, because I work in the community, but I, but I like that giving opportunity. I do a lot of these grants and stuff and to give opportunity to other trans people to build their skills, to build the next uh, activists and the next advocates in our community and, and empowering them. I think it's important uh, to, you know, giving them those tools, right? So I also do some mentoring stuff through my work and I find that very empowering because of listening to people and what they need and supporting them and giving them that. But also I think it's really important people that see the need to support what we're doing is to actually, you know, donate to us nonprofits like Trans Pride Toronto so we can keep the work going. Mm -hmm. We can keep community employed or keep people striving, you know, um, you know, because that's really vital for us. That's vital for us to make sure that no one is left behind. You know, um, I self-care a lot. I, I, I still do a lot of work. I'm still out there, but I know how to say no now. You know, um, I, I know how to tell people that want me to like go on, do all these sort of panels. I'm not the only person out in this community. It's not just my experience. You know what I mean? You need to start doing your research and you need to be finding people out there that have a story to tell. You know what I mean? Because there are a lot of ab advocates in our community that are doing amazing work. Or there are a lot of people in our communities that have stories that can really change what's going mm -hmm. on in our communities, right? So I've, you know, like I'm still on this board and this committee and, you know, in the term review, I'm actually one of the participants of the new uh, sex work challenge, the courts uh, changing the laws and stuff. Those are really things that I love to do, but, and I'm there, like I'm there, but I, like I said, I'm older now, I'm in my fifties. <laughs> so, you know, um, you know, I'm not as, as, I'm still a quick thinker, but I, you know, I'm not as, my mobility is maybe not as quick as I used to be, you know, um, but I'm out there, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm still staying visible, but I'm really working with our newer generations to really empower them to be the best they can be and making sure that they're <laughs> still staying there, you know what I mean? Because there's still a lot of work to be done. It's still not over. Thank you so much. Well, I feel like that's probably taking us to the end of this too short conversation with you folks. Um, how are you feeling? Is there anything you need at this juncture? I just want to thank you so much. Um, to the fact that you're able to still be here, still be around, still be shouting into the microphone and you know, having cigarettes and you know swearing and uh, you know being thoughtful and uh, Countess of like, yeah, I didn't bring my accordion out. <laughs> you would be graced with your accordion. No way, Jose. <laughs> Thank you so much. I heard um, you play pretty well. <laughs> yeah, so I'm in the process. I've been writing a book for the last year. Oh, oh yes. It's, Let's finish with it's that. It's a lot hard because I right have now? like. What would you like to point? Yeah, so it's called Trans Feminism, Trans Feminism and Doing It My Way. So it really talks about my work. It talks about 
when I first came out and how conforming that we had to be and how over my 30 plus years, how I become who I am, right? And kind of, kind of resisted some of the norms of, you know what I mean, what a trans woman should be. You know what I mean? Or, um, you know, so this is something I've been writing. Um, I think it's important um, to bring in another perspective that we're, we all are individuals Then we, you know what I mean? And breaking away from this colonial kind of idea that cisgender people have to live with, but then we have to live with because we need to only, can only be accepted because if we look a certain way and act a certain way. And, you know, talk about, you know, I'm a parent. I have a five-year-old son. You know, when you talk about my sexuality, that's been across the board when in my community, the sex work community, being a, a poly woman, uh, you know, especially among other trans women of color was mm. taboo. You know what I mean? So there's so much that I had to, you know, to really experience through my life uh, in the community and outside of the community, right? And how I just started living for me. And I think... When I first, because I there was a quote I kind of, one day I was so frustrated and I was like, I felt like I was living in other people's hell. Like I really mm-hmm. felt like I was living for other people. I had to look a certain way, act a certain way, be a certain way. And it just, I was, you know, my mental health was in a, like in a, in a place where it's like, I didn't, didn't want to live because I just felt like I couldn't be me. And then that day when I said, fuck everyone, I'm going to live for me. That's when things started changing. You know what I mean? Yeah, I got laughed at and I got, you know what I mean? Uh, oh, that Monica this and Monica that. But at the end of the day, you know what? I have trans women say, I want to have kids. Or I have trans women saying, you know, I can be, you know, I can love women and men and trans people. You know what I mean? And be and- open and out about it. And like when Mira talks about, you know, I kind of envied Mira and Sam because they were so free about their love. You know what I mean? I and didn't I- know you knew we were lovers. It's true. Did you? You know, like I dated women as a sex worker. But, oh, good Lord. All my, all my peers are like, oh, Monica, ooh, ooh. You know, or I did a trans or this or that. And you they know, imagined me I was with another trans woman. <laughs> Fuck. You know, so, but you know, it's like, you know, things are changing. And it's really great that, you know, we can be who we want to be. And I want to express that in my book and how, you know, I'm breaking away from these ideas that we have to be a certain way to be accepted. So Thank you, it's Maya. taking a long time because I have so yeah. much going on, but I'll get it out there one of these days. And we'll look forward to reading it. And how about Rupert and uh, Mira? Anything going on right now on the creative side for you? Oh. Uh, how are you doing? And any yeah, final I remarks? You that I writing that article and connections between uh, trans connections between English Canada and French Canada. That's in my book. And I've been talking to all three archives, uh, well, three of the archives in Canada for the research. Wonderful. Okay, Mira, any last words? Uh, I live here happily in the south of Montreal. Uh, it's traditionally called uh, Gendage, La Prairie de Prairie. It's a Mohawk word. We live on unceded, uh, can we say that unceded? Unceded uh, Mohawk territory, Ganigahaga. And I live here with uh, my partner. And it was a pleasure for all of us, including my cat earlier, to be part <laughs> of uh, your gathering tonight. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to have Tabaran, Tabaran, the uh, curator of this exhibit. Uh, Tabaran Waxman is a wonderful, amazing, prolific artist who has put this all together uh, from the archives. Uh, Tabaran, can you join us and just say a few words? Okay, and thank so you so much. much. Thank you. Um, Mira and Rupert, you, you made me cry. <laughs> and I'm always so grateful that testosterone has not taken away my ability to cry. Um, I hope that um, people who are in Toronto or can get to Toronto who have been watching tonight can take some time to come to the archives and enjoy this exhibition. A number of the topics that um, all of our panelists raised are addressed through different kinds of artifacts like 
historic pieces of newspaper from all the way back from the 1950s, all of the prison correspondence that Mira and Rupert made is here. Of course, you can't read it for privacy reasons, but I found a way to make it present here without um, crossing any privacy uh, personal boundaries. Lots of manifestations here of art and culture and coalition and ways that trans people have been involved in Toronto in uh, prison correspondence, uh, mutual aid, and various other projects. Um, I think it's important to learn about and it's important to learn from, from each other while we're still alive. Coming to the archives is not like, um, I don't know, uh, like a, a, a dusty box of old things. It's a live, dynamic, fun, treasure hunt kind of an experience. At least that's what I've tried to use the gallery to do. We're trying to up the fabulosity quotient, bring trans people here, and bring intergenerational conversations together. Um, because it's fun and it's inspiring and very moving. And I think that these are the things that are critical to our survival. Um, so I just want to thank Sly um, for doing such an elegant and graceful and generous moderation tonight. I, uh, we just met and Sly agreed to do this after I told him I can't uh, because I would lose it. He did a fantastic job. Um, I haven't seen Rupert in ages, and it's such a delight to hear you talk about all these different aspects of your timeline after I've been handling all of your letters and your writing dating back to like 1972, I think. Um, and Monica, I think we're getting together in a couple of days to shoot some video, which will also be included here. Um, back to back with Rupert Remembers. So um, again, I just want to invite people to come by anytime. And if you are trans, you're also invited to start a collection here and we will give you a tax receipt. It's the best storage for your cherished trans lore. It's never going to be destroyed. It's never going to be lost in a fire. It's never going to be destroyed by water or black mold. And you can also determine who gets to see it. Some of Mira's stuff isn't going to be touched by anybody until 25 years after she's passed on. <laughs> Some of it, you, you can sit right here in the little reading lounge that I've prepared for you and enjoy it live and in person here today in the air conditioning. It's a very comfortable place to hang out. So everyone is welcome and I hope you will come again. Thank you to everyone who came. Thank you to Sly and thank you to Myceum for inviting this to, to happen. Uh, was it three years ago before COVID? And now we finally, finally did it. I'm so grateful. Thank you. Wonderful. I think Sly, Sly gets the last word. Well, um, on that note, I'm going to come back to Ayanna Miracle and a quote from her, um, her theories and her lived realities. And again, thank you so much, uh, Monica Forrester, Mira Soleil Ross, Rupert Raj, uh, Tobaran Waxman, the Archives Museum for this uh, amazing Intersections event, Activisions uh, exhibit that's happening here at the Archives. Please come check it down. Thank you, the audience at home, for engaging with us and taking in these amazing histories. And I'll leave you with a quote from Ian America. <laughs> um, I feel my choice of trans, it's on the note of language and use of language since it's always been changing since, you know, the 50s and onwards, and we're still in a state of change. So I feel my choice of transformed woman to be a more appropriate term in that it follows the logic and structure of indigenous languages, where things are named more by functionality or by interrelation. Also, in keeping with my cultural perspective, I make no attempt scientifically to prove anything. My being and life and those of others are the evidence for my assertions in this paper. 
In our society, scientific proof was derived over time in that something worked or it did not. This plant or these combinations of plants and or minerals will heal this or that. We did not need to break down some herb into minute parts to discover how or why it worked. We knew that it did, used it, and were grateful. We knew which particular ceremonies or prayers could influence the healing process, and we knew what kinds of social structures would lead to healthy communities. All of this was based on the premise that we are merely a part of this world and must find our way to live in a healthy balance with those around us in accordance with directives received from our goddesses and gods. The grandmothers had surrounded us with all that was necessary to lead a healthy life. And we as human beings, the people, were charged with its perpetual maintenance. And we are surrounded by our grandmothers and our transcestors. And I thank you all so much. Have a good night. Thank you.